Good afternoon, Facebook Live. This is Robin Kirby Ghetto. Welcome to today. It's going to be an awesome day. It is a special day. Why is it special? Because I am doing a book coaching session, which will be session 18 for those that are doing book coaching for my new book, Mindfulness, The Mind of Christ on Amazon. And so you get to join in today as Holy Spirit brings a message of power to strengthen you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I hope you're super excited and you get to be blessed like those that join in for the actual book coaching sessions and you get to be a part of us today. Hey, Deborah. Hey, Lisa Covert. Love y'all. They are in the book coaching session. So is Katie Higgum who's Elizabeth Higgum on Facebook. Hey, lady. Hey, Suzanne Williams. God bless you. And so today we are going to do book coaching session 18, and we're at the end of chapter 5. Normally, I do three book coaching sessions a chapter, but chapter 5 is a little special because this will be the final book coaching session for chapter 5. And it's the sixth, okay? The sixth. Is that not amazing? Hey, Dina Woolley, God bless you. Dina's also in book coaching. I know a lot of y'all are jumping on here. I get to do this today because yesterday the Zoom app, Zoom in general, was just not really doing the right thing, which worked to my benefit. And God said, Robin, go ahead and do book coaching session 18 on YouTube on Facebook so that people can be a part of it and see what goes on in book coaching. Listen, I never intended on starting coaching for this book until God brought it into my heart. And the reason that he has me doing book coaching is because in those sessions, I bring in things that are not in the book to expound on it. If I would have written everything that is in my heart, because I'm very exhaustive on a subject matter, I want to cover all ends. Hey, Monica. So if I had every opportunity to write everything that was in my heart, for this particular book, this would have been a thousand pages, okay? And the good thing about book coaching is you get, and Christine's on there. God bless you, Christina. Congratulations on your marriage. And so, Christina's actually in book coaching too. And so, the good thing about book coaching videos is you can watch them a gazillion times. It's unlimited. And it absolutely expounds on the book. And it just makes it so rich and deep. And I'm just going to give you a heads up. We've already, you're welcome, Christina. We've already had 17 sessions before today's session. There's Dawn Mitchell, Kim Mitchell. She's in it as well. God bless you, Kim. And so it is going to be deep. And I'm a very deep person. And you get to see why I'm so deep today. You will understand why I'm so deep. And so as we get started, as always, I always open up with prayer. So let us enter into today's message in prayer. Amen. God, we just celebrate the name of Jesus Christ. God, it is such a beautiful name to say Jesus, which means salvation is in Jehovah. God, all salvation is in you. That salvation covers everything we need healing, deliverance, prosperity of soul. It brings completeness to our members, flooding us with joy, overflowing as our cup is filled to the brim and spills over. God, let us spill over today with your love, with the truth of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, Sue Gailey, love you. Thank you for joining in. Sue Gailey is awesome in book coaching. And so, I am. first of all, let me just say thank you for those that do book coaching. And again, listen, I want everybody to get book coaching. It is not a set fee. If you have difficult times paying or anything, 
message me and we will work something out because I want everybody who truly wants book coaching to get it. So we are in chapter five of mindfulness, the mind of Christ. We are at the very end. This is part six of chapter five. And again, as in book coaching, most chapters have only three sessions. Hey, Sandra, Sandra just started book coaching. Most chapters only have three book coaching sessions, but this chapter is very special and it has six sessions. And today is the sixth and the last session for chapter five. And so let us get started. We are looking at truth. Prior, we've looked at information with information theory and how information of this present age, and that's going to be the emphasis today, information of this present age is loud in our members from the neck down. And I've already preceded this session with chapter four as we looked at the molecules of information. And so at the receptor level in the body, the G protein coupled receptor, which this book begins to unfold chapter by chapter, starting in chapter four on the intro of the language of fruit and what fruit looks like. It is a language and you and I speak it every day as the consecrated body is communicating to the transformed mind. And out of the two comes the language of fruit. We can't hear the language of fruit audibly. We can't see it written with our eyes visibly, but this is the thing. And this is where we're going we know this language within the members of our body as our senses are opened up. And you're saying, Robin, wait a minute. What are you talking about? Where's that in scripture? You've got to wait till next chapter, chapter six, where God has me unpack Isaiah seven and Genesis three about our senses in our body from the neck down and again, the expression of those senses are at this particular receptor. It is called the G protein coupled receptor. And so we've already gone over it just a little bit in the last chapter as I brought in pictures in the book as well as the colored pictures that I have. And just to give you some idea of these pictures so you're not totally lost. This is some of the pictures that I brought in from chapter four of the G protein coupled receptor. These receptors are on every chromosome of your body. They are expressed in your senses. And so there is a lot of information that we've already gone over about the G protein coupled receptor, but we're not going to unpack all of that today. What we are unpacking today is the power of the truth. Oh my goodness, I feel like running. Because you're going to understand what is limiting you within the subconscious neck down in the body, which is your temple. The body, the consecrated body, Romans 12, 1, is the temple of Holy Spirit it disseminates the information of power. It disseminates the message of power within the body as well as bring that information to the mind. And so we've been uh, studying entropy in chapter five. And entropy is chaos. Entropy is disorder. Entropy in information theory, which is a science, is randomness and uncertainty. So what does it look like? It looks like information from the neck down in the subconscious that begins to unpack and what we know is feelings and emotions, which is part of the language of fruit. However, if we get a microscope and really home in and look at what 
neuroscientists, immunologists, endocrinologists have all collaborated and defined at the receptor level our emotions are actually memories stored that are unpacking. So this book really hones in on this particular receptor, which is largely responsible for all your senses, for most diseases, for addictions, for dementia, for memory, you name it. This receptor also communicates the most between neurons where neurons communicate 98% chemically, largely at this receptor. So let me tell you, this receptor is very important. And God is giving us hidden manna so that we have knowledge, wisdom, and understanding as knowledge increases in this time in order to see what truth does. John 8, 32, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Today is such a precious day because I get to bring in one of my most favorite teachings that I began to teach in 2012, 2014, 2014, as God had me bring in the Omega track, which is the fourth year of God's firewall school, the prophets. And he's going to bring in also session 22 workbook of God's firewall healing of the soul. Both of those schools that I did many years ago. Amen. That's where we're getting to Tina. Hold on. Don't steal the thunder. Wait on sister. And so both of those two schools interweave. And just to let you know, usually I'm recording these book coaching sessions with no interaction. I want you to interact. Just don't steal my thunder because largely I teach these with no one on the other end. And it's just me and the camera. And that's what I'm used to. But I want you to be a part of it. Amen. Just don't steal the thunder. Amen. And so... We're going to look at what is known as the fourth dimension. The fourth dimension is harvest. And you're saying, Robin, where is that in scripture? We're going to get to it. And you're going to understand truth as never before. And it is absolutely phenomenal. And I'm going to go into session 22. And it's funny because two plus two equals what? Four of God's firewall school of the Healing of the soul. Thank you, Tina. I know you're excited. Of God's Bible, Healing of the Soul. And I'm going to unpack all the names in the book of Nehemiah that confirms about this fourth dimension. So at the beginning of God's Bible, School of the Prophets, starting in session 27 for the last year, Oh my goodness, God had me bring in Einstein's theory with the Tesseract. And with the Tesseract, it's the fourth dimension. Now, Tessa means four. And so we're going to look at the fourth dimension. And it's going to shift your mindset to understand that you and I are from a different planet. So to speak, we're from a different time zone. Now, in the last session, session 17, oh my goodness, we shifted to understand that we're from a different time zone. Our time zone is not seasonal. Our time zone is eternity. It's harvest. And in the last session, session 17, this is so powerful, all the scriptures were 27, 27, 27. It was like verse 27 of all these scriptures in the Bible. And God brought revelation that 27 is our time zone. It's peace. It's shalom. John 14, 27, Jesus came to distribute to us a peace that is not of what? This world. Okay, it's not of this time. But Jesus distributes a peace 
that's from heaven. And that's a different time zone. And that's the way that we're going to look at today's teaching as we end with truth to unpack so you can comprehend what truth does inside of your body, what it does in your temple. And so let's start with the core parable in Mark 4. And just to let you know, today's teaching will go a little longer. So if you cannot watch it all, that is fine. Go ahead and watch my video on YouTube on my regular channel. And for those of y'all in book coaching, I will send you this video in Messenger as your supplement for today's coaching. And so we're going to look at Mark 4, which is at the end of chapter 5. And this is going to really be the microscope for you to comprehend what truth is, what it is, what it actually is in your members. Mostly it's an enigma, it's a mystery. But God brings such a microscopic view about truth so you can understand. And this is so important because Romans 10, 17, you shall know the, the truth, of course, John 8, 32, and the truth shall set you free. But faith comes. Say, faith comes, right? Faith comes by hearing the word, the very message, Romans 10, 17, the very message spoken off the lips of Christ Jesus. And again, 17 means consecration. Faith comes by hearing the word. The very message spoken by Paul, spoken by uh, Tim Timothy, spoken by David. No, it says spoken off the lips of Jesus. Okay? So everything in the Old Testament and New Testament by other anointed authors of truth in the Bible that contributed to the works of God, to the voice, the message that was being distributed in eternity to us, this word, all of those messages will always, 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 always point to the gospel to where Jesus Christ is teaching, okay? And so, we're going to Mark 4, which will be the launch pad for today's teaching. And now we're looking at the Tesseract, the fourth dimension. When we look at different dimensions and we look at just a piece of paper, this piece of paper with just a dot on it, with just a one dot would be the first dimension. But when you put another dot on it, and you connect that dot, that dimension is unpacked to where you can see more. It's not just a dot. There's a connection. Remember that. There's a connection, okay? But when you get another dot and another dot, and you have two lines, that becomes two-dimensional. So it's no longer just a line. It's two lines. And those two lines become a square, just a basic square. That's a second dimension. But oh my goodness, when those two lines become a square that is amplified to where you can see it's just a cube, that becomes three-dimensional. That is where you and I live. We live in the third dimension. But oh my goodness, when you connect a cube with another cube and all the intersections and lines are drawn, which basically becomes eight cubes, then you have a fourth dimension and that is called the Tesseract. And Tessa means four. Now, some of you are probably saying, Robin, I don't understand. Why are you bringing in this fourth dimension? Because right now, when we exist in this world, as I brought in entropy earlier, and I talked about entropy, entropy is 
chaos, its disorder, the clock for earthly time, the clock that moves us forward in this time is entropy, it's chaos. The reason that we keep going forward in this time is chaos. The reason that there are changes of time when you look at it in a microscopic level, it is chaos. And so entropy, chaos exists in this world and it is the time clock. It moves us forward. But this is the thing. We are in this world, but not of it. Amen, Suzanne. We are in this world, but not of it. What a lot of Christians do is they don't separate themselves through consecration of the body by truth in their members to be holy unto God. And as a result, they're caught in this present time where they're changing seasons, okay? And this is the new thing that God's been telling me as I've been teaching it. He said, Robin, my people are not of seasons. Every day, as you become great, growing strong in spirit and growing strong in spirit, Luke 1, 80, John the Baptist grew strong in spirit. Luke 2, 40, Jesus grew strong in spirit. That growing strong in spirit equals growing strong in truth. That equals eternity planted in our heart. That equals faith. That equals water walking mindset. Do you hear this, saints? Because there is another dimension. It is the supernatural. And that dimension exists outside of this time zone. It exists in a different time zone. And this time zone is available to you and I today. And the way to peer into this time zone, which is eternity, which is the age to come, that comes to us by the power of Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth, the way to peer into this today is going to be in the Tesseract. And again, Tessa comes from four, which is Tessa. And you're going to see that all the scriptures that God lays out today, and as I bring in one of my notes that I wrote back about eight, nine years ago, I'm going to bring in that tesseract, which is the fourth dimension. So let me show you what a tesseract looks like in order to perceive such intricacies of a whole other dimension. So this is the way the fourth dimension looks like a cube within a cube. But do you know what it looks like when it's called a net, N-E-T, net. So nets are thrown out for what? Catching fish, but also when we look at the word net and its meaning, we get a greater revelation. So net means it remains after the deduction. That's the word that is emphasized this week, is remain. See, what happens is, is you walk in what remains inside of you, not what deducted from you. We want truth in our members. Jesus says in Luke 22 to the disciples, you are those that have remained with me in my trials. So my father has given me a kingdom and I too will give you seats in that kingdom. Do you understand that we go with the word? When the word is persecuted, it's not us that's persecuted. We're just the vessel carrying the seed 
And that seed grows up in us as we get Psalm 42, 7, roaring deep, crying out to roaring deep at the breaking forth of God's water spouts. That means how deep do you want to go in truth? The deeper you go, the closer you will get to a different time zone, the closer you will get to another dimension in order to peer at everything that is going on in your life and in this present age by the eyes of God and not yours. What's limiting you right now is the mountain of information distracting you as white noise in your subconscious from the neck down where that information at the receptor level is broadcasting a signal to be louder than truth. And God is going to expose that today and annihilate. And you're going to be stirred by faith. And you're going to speak to that mountain. And you're going to see it cast into the sea. When you have this kind of faith, this faith, is eternal. It comes from God. It's the work of God. It's the fruit of God. It's the kingdom of heaven. Our Father, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Do you know that what caused Peter to step into a different dimension to walk on water was faith? What caused me to experience the supernatural that defies gravity, that can lift a body into the air and carry it through rooms is a different dimension that brings deliverance and sets free. What came upon my body, not one time, two times, three times, four times, but several times in different times of my life, was a new time zone. And that time zone is the power of the age to come. And it is outside of what happens in this earth. It defies physics. It defies logic to where you don't fall when you get out of the boat and you walk on water. There is a different time zone of faith that lifts you up, hallelujah, on a mountain like an eagle soaring to the sun where you have seen the glory of the truth, hallelujah, and it has lifted you up above your present state, above your present condition, and it defies all that this earth would limit you. That is faith. Woo! Hallelujah. And that's where we're looking at Mark 4. So Mark 4, now understand we're going to do a lot of 4s. And this was in yesterday's teaching and God just brought it in. And it just happened to be a lot of fours. And so Mark 4 is the core parable. And so in the core parable, in verse 20, we see that good seed, that seed on good soil is planted and some yields 30, some yield 60, and some yield a hundredfold. And now one of the things I've always wanted to know is why does some yield 30 God? Why does some yield 60 God? And why do some get the fullness, the hundredfold? And he began to show me with entropy. And so entropy and information is randomness. It's white noise. It's uncertainty. It's that (sighs) noise in your members, in your subconscious, in memories of the knowledge of evil, where the enemy has lied to you, where fear, rejection, depression, oppression, being broke, disgusted, lonely, is all in your body, and it begins to talk to you by manifesting in your feelings, by manifesting in your emotions, and this is where God is going to expose it today. Because that white noise of the enemy that would have you look at everything in life and randomly put it together and put symbolism to it 
And it's saying, I'm going to be broke. I'm going to be disgusted. I'm going to be busted because I did this wrong. This happened. I saw this today. And this was spoken to me by so-and-so. And it will get you to agree with the enemy. You might as well get your head and beat it against the wall. Not really. But yes, that's an, an, an analogy. Amen, Candace. G- Candy, God showing us. Amen. And so let's look at Mark 4. Because we're going to go to Zechariah 4. Now understand 4 means harvest. Why does 4 mean harvest? John 4, Jesus is spending time, time, time with a Samaritan woman. And he's getting her into his time zone where she sees past the labels, past the rejection, past the brokenness, past the depression. She sees past her poverty, her broken heart, and she sees unto eternity as she beholds Jesus, the Son of God, who is truth, the way and the life, to who? The Father. The Father to us is eternity. God is eternal. He is eternity. And this is what we're going to see. And so in John 4, which 4 means tesseract, the fourth dimension, and also tessa, 4 is the base of the name Teresa, and Teresa means harvest. So in John 4, Jesus ministers to the Samaritan woman. She's at the well, broke, busted, and disgusted. Why? Because she's in this time zone. She's in seasons. Ecclesiastes 3. There is a season for this, a season for that, a season for war, a season for peace, a season for laughing, a season for crying. Do you know because of Jesus, because of truth, we are taken out of those seasons? It doesn't mean we don't experience trials, but this is a thing. Even to the bitter trial to the hungry soul tastes sweet. Proverbs 27, 7. What does that mean? That no matter what the trial is, no matter the circumstance, it's not your season, it's your harvest. This is why so many Christians stay bound up because they're in this earthly time zone. And so Jesus was given the Samaritan woman a new time zone, a new perspective. She's at Jacob's well and he brings the well of living waters Now remember that because Holy Spirit in us comes forth out of our belly with what? Living waters. That is a metaphor for Holy Spirit inside of our members as that different time zone. As the power, Hebrews 6, 4 through 6, of the age to come. And that's what we're going to look at. Amen. And that is also bringing in the fours. And so in, let me finish, I forgot this before I get to Mark 4. Oh my goodness, let me say this because I'm going to forget. And so John 4, Jesus tells the woman by the spirit of prophecy all of her issues and she perceives him a prophet and then he says as she identifies about the Son of God coming that he is the Son of God and that God is going to seek those who worship him, what, in spirit and in truth, spirit, and in truth, the different time zone, the harvest time zone, and so his disciples come to him, and say, are you hungry, and he said, my meat is to do the will of the Father, he's in a different time zone, he's not hungry, things cease when you're in that time zone, eternity, and so Jesus then tells the disciples, what, Do not say how many months? Four. Do not say four months until the what? Harvest. For I tell you, look up. The harvest is here. And so the harvest was souls coming into the kingdom. So God is a harvest God. Your harvest of his fruits, of his righteousness, of his good works within your members is every day. It's not seasonal. The harvest of souls coming into the kingdom is every day. It's not seasonal. It's a different time zone. 
And so we see Jesus addressing to the disciples, listen, this is not my time zone. My time zone is the kingdom. She's eaten of the kingdom. Her eyes have been opened and she's no longer a fornicator. She's no longer an adulteress. She's no longer married to those of this present age. She's married to God. She's married to eternity. So you can call her, glory to God, this is for somebody out there. You can, All those that tell you getting married a second time, you're, they're going to hell. No, you're not. They're of this present age. They're of the seasons of this present age. And FYI, the reason that Moses told the those of Israel to give their wife a bill of divorcement was because they were already emotionally divorced and they were abusive, verbally, psychologically abusive. And so they were already divorced and their wife was being held to a false reality. Do you understand? It's no different than the chaos of this present age of the labels of the enemy against your soul and the knowledge of evil, of labels, of curses, of mindsets, of failures, of verbal accusations, of all of these things coming together inside of your body at the receptor level that are unpacking and they're looking for opportunity to come out. That God, by faith, takes you into a different time zone and that is harvest. And he lifts you up above all the labels of this world. Above your dis-ease, Lisa. Above your failings. Above your mental issues. He lifts you above your addictions. He lifts you above all of the things. Poverty. The, the joblessness. Homelessness. He lifts you above it. But to the degree that you can see from a heavenly perspective from the fourth dimension, hallelujah, the harvest dimension is the degree that you get the title deed to what you're expecting inside of your body that will be manifest in the natural. You're drawing it within your members. Hebrews 11.1, faith is the title deed. The things that are hoped for, the evidence of things that are not yet seen. So where are they seen? By the eyes of our body, the eyes of our heart. We know it. We can smell it in our body. We can hear it in our body. And it is truth. It is Holy Scriptures speaking to us all the time. Oh my goodness, I better get going because I'm not going to get enough time. Who knows, maybe this will be too broadcast. And it just will be. Amen. And so, amen, Sue. And so, let's get to Mark 4. Mark 4, verse 20. Now, let's start with verse 21. Because this is what I asked God. I said, God, why do some people get 30, some people get 60, and some people get 100 fold? He said, Robin, because the information of this present age becomes a mountain. The information of this present age becomes a mountain. Ten. Oh my goodness, are you ready for this? Because when God had me study entropy, this is an example. Remember, entropy is chaos. And so on this side, and I know this looks kind of like matrix, on this side, you have the binomial system, zeros and ones, which is the old computer language. And then you have it scattered on this side, where there is disorder. And so there's no order. And because there's no order, there is just randomness. There's just randomness. And this is what God began to show me. He said, Robin, I want you to shift in your mindset and to look at those mountains as just that binomial system, just like they did on the Matrix. And I'm not saying watch the movie. I'm just saying that this is the analogy. And so if you look at your mountain, it is just information. It is just information. It is just information. And in chapter five, or in chapter five, yes, in chapter five and in chapter four, I talk about it coming from bits. 
Your reality comes from information. And I talk about John Archibald Wheeler, the physicist who turned physics upside down, when he said information is more important than matter and energy. Why did he say that? Because scientists had always thought that matter and energy produces information. They never considered the idea that matter and energy comes from information. So like what was first, the chicken or the egg? That is what he produced and presented to the realm of physics, which absolutely turned it upside down. And so this is what you have to look at. And we're going to look at Mark 4 at the core of the core parable, which I do have in the book. And then we're going to look at Zechariah 4, which I also have in the book at the end of chapter 5. And we're going to look at the mountain in Zechariah 4. And we're going to perceive that the mountain is just information. It's just information. It is just information. Do you see this? Your dis-ease, your failures, your poverty, your broken relationships, your addictions, your failed attempts at doing something prosperous, that is just information. And it's all operative in your person. And that is why some only get 30, 60 fold because they're looking at their destiny over a mountain. So let's say there is no mountain. You get a hundredfold. What does that mean? You get the fullness of the power of the message of truth in your members to produce what it's supposed to produce. If you get the thirtyfold, you might get partial healing. You might get partial freedom. And you're saying, wait, Robin, but God delivers all the way. Yes, he does. But how much information is hindering you from getting the fullness of eternity and the age to come? Where you've got some symptoms that are no longer manifesting, but you still have other symptoms of the dis-ease. You still have other tendencies of the addiction you're still drawing the same relationships to you, walking in rejection and depression. That's the 30 and the 60 fold, and we've got to get past that. So let's look at Mark 4, and let's see the scripture as God brings us more insight. Amen. Mark 4, and we're going to the core of the core parable. And so in the book, I have an orange in the book. And in the book, you see that the seeds in the Valencia orange, and I've already done that, by the way, and it's on page 128. The seeds on the outside are like the seeds in our soul. But this core of the orange is the core of the core parable. The core, when we look at the core parable of Mark 4, of the seeds, the core of the core parable is verses 21 through 25. So let's read verse 21. And he said to them, Is the lamp brought to be put under a peck measure or under a bed and not to be put on a lamp stand? Lamp stand? Things are hidden temporarily only as a means to revelation. For there is nothing hidden except to be revealed, nor is anything temporarily kept secret except in order that it be made known. If any man has ears to hear, let him be listening, let him perceive and comprehend. Except he's not talking about the ears on our head. He's talking about the ears, the audio receptors in our body. Because Satan perverted the senses and even Adam's body in Genesis 3, and he cut off the eternal time. He switched them to a different time zone where there was no peace. There's chaos and pain and toil and labor and fighting and arguing and striving. Because of Jesus Christ, who's from eternity... 
He's now taking us back to a different time zone, and that's faith. And faith gives us peace, shalom, eternity. Luke 17, 20 and 21, in our hearts. And that also represents the light. So let's look at verses 21. And he said, Mark 4, and he said to them, Is the lamp brought into be put under a peck measure or under a bed? And not to be put on the lampstand. Things are hidden temporarily only as a means to revelation. For there is nothing hidden except to be revealed, nor is anything temporarily kept secret except in order that it's made known. If any man has ears to hear, let him be listening, let him perceive, let him comprehend. And he said to them, Be careful what you're hearing. The measure of thought and study you give to the truth you hear will be the measure of virtue and knowledge that comes back to you. Woo! And more besides will be given to you who hear. For to him who has will more be given. And him who has nothing, even what he has, will be taken away. And he said to them, the kingdom of God. Now this is where we see the light. We just talked about the light. The light is the metaphor for what makes the seed grow. The seed, the word, grows in our temple. It matures 30, 60, 100 fold to the degree that faith arises in us and we are purified, we are consecrated by our faith through trials and tribulations where we're getting lifted up from the things of this present age to gain a new perspective because the pain has moved us into desperation to leave earth. Do you understand that you're an alien in this earth when you're born from above, when you have salvation? And that's the thing, saints, is we become so comfortable, we become so convenient convenience oriented that we have become of this world and as a result it nullifies the power of the truth and people are bound up and this is what God is exposing in this hour and so the core of the core parable the lamp is brought into the room you see at the beginning of this core the core parable is a measure and a measure so you see measure light measure and it sandwiches light. So what the core parable shows us, and I've got a picture of it in my book, and it is page 134. It is the picture of this heart, and it is to cause you to look at truth differently. Truth is an instrument. Say that. Type that in. Truth is an instrument, okay? So what truth does is it measures it measures, it measures, it measures. So in order to experience fruit, the kingdom of heaven, which is crowding us, it's near. We see it and we seize it and we pluck it and we eat it and we experience it. What, amen, Lisa, what causes us to experience that is measuring it, to measure it. So as we measure every circumstance, every trial, every occasion in this earth, we measure it either through truth or the lie. When we're measuring it through truth, there is power and ability by the Spirit of Truth, Holy Spirit, and He is the light. And He comes into our darkness, into our trial, where we have a need. I can't make it in life. God, I want you to take me out. But instead of killing me, instead of taking me to onto glory, lift me up to the age that is to come. Lift me high on a mountain. Cause me to see eternity that's planted in my heart where this mountain of information that's before me 
comes down in the name of Jesus because I've had it. It's the last straw. I'm fed up and I'm about to get a big fork and I'm about to chomp on that mountain with the word of truth is I devour the enemy and see his lives destroyed. That is jealousy of God where he is a jealous God. He is a holy God. Amen. Woo! So after the core parable, the core of the core parable, which is about the light, the light is truth, the spirit of truth in your body. And that spirit of truth, Holy Spirit, causes the seed to grow. How do we see this? We see this in verse 26, where Jesus is now combining the seed and the soil, and he's now combining the light, which causes the seed to grow. And then he says this, and he said, the kingdom of God is like a man who scattered seed upon the ground. And he continues sleeping and rising night and day while the seed sprouts and it grows, it increases and he knows not how it defies this present age. The earth produces by itself, first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe and permits, immediately he sends forth the reapers and puts in the sickle because the harvest stands ready. The harvest stands ready. Do you understand we are of a different time zone. And that time zone is going to require Isaiah 4, 4, where he washes the moral filth of the daughters of Zion. He washes away the moral filth and he purifies Jerusalem, Israel. And he allows us to go through the spirit and blast of judgment and the spirit and blast of burning and sifting, which means what? Trials tribulation, suffering. First Peter 1, 6 and 7, be exceedingly glad, rejoice when you experience fiery trials and tribulations and suffer temptations that the testing of your faith, which is more precious, the testing of your faith, woo, which is more precious than gold, will redound to your glory, to your praise, to your honor, when Jesus, woo, when the truth, hallelujah, when the way, the life, hallelujah, the age to come, hallelujah, is revealed. I'm in a different time zone. That's why things in my time zone don't operate as in this time zone. See, I don't have seasons. I have harvest. I have harvest every day, every day, every day, every day because I'm in a different time zone. You get your deliverance. You get your healing. You get your breakthrough. You get prosperity of the soul. You get health when you are of a different time zone. You're alien to the things of this world. And isn't it interesting, and I did this just yesterday and it blew my mind, because we don't realize how agreeing with the lie of the enemy is not only a mountain of information in front of our eyes, but we actually begin to agree with that lie, and it is enmity with God. Remember, the Greek word for faith is pistis, and it means persuasion, and it also means friend. And so whatever you have your faith in, if it's the faith of this truth or the faith of your emotions that need to be cut off, pruned, which is in chapter 6, and will come in a later book coaching where we're going to be set free. You're going to see the power of the Spirit of Truth come in to your receptor, and it is going to remove the present age, the lies of the enemy, and it is going to bring in a dimension that is eternal and is manifest unto your members. Oh my goodness, I got to hurry up because this is going to be a long broadcast because I want to finish this chapter today. Amen. So pray for me. So now let's get to James 4.4. 4. Watch this. We're talking about four. You get a harvest 
of either eternity or you get a harvest of this present age. You have whatsoever you speak. Do you understand this? You've got to guard your mouth. So James 4, 4, so 4 represents harvest, right? You are like unfaithful wives having illicit love affairs with the world and breaking your marriage vow to God. Do you not know that being the world's friend is being God's enemy? So whoever chooses to be a friend of the world takes his stand as the enemy of God. That is James 4, 4. But what did we say? Isaiah 4, 4 is the spirit and blast of burning and sifting, which is the word being persecuted and the washing of the word. You have those two things in Isaiah 4, 4. But now let's get to Zechariah 4 because this is going to be where we end. And then I'm going to bring you understanding as I talk about, oh my goodness, as I talk about Mandelbrot, Mandelbrot, and I talk about more the fourth dimension. And so I've got to also bring, and I will try to post, and I copied and pasted it from session 22, which I wrote in 2014 for God's Firewall Healing of the Soul, which is about the fourth dimension, as I unpacked the book of Nehemiah and what the names mean. So don't let me get off this broadcast without saying it. Amen, Lisa. Get ready. Are you ready? And so Zechariah 4, we're looking at verse 7. And in verse 7, there is a mountain before Zerubbabel. And do you understand that when Zerubbabel grabs the plumb line, that Holy Spirit rejoices. And all he's doing, he's not laid the foundation yet. He's just grabbing the plumb line to finish the foundation. Holy Spirit is rejoicing because of that little one act of obedience. And this is interesting because when I, I have a plumb line here in the book, in chapter 5, on page 139, there it is at a close level. It's hard to see, but there it is. And the Hebrew word picture for plumb line. Are you ready? It's two words. It is Eben and it is Bedel. It is Eben Bedel. Eben Bedel. Those two Hebrew words combine together in the ancient Olive Bet language symbols. This is the word picture. Are you ready? The strength and activity of life in a house is in the works of the house, evidenced in the tongue that controls it. What? Listen to this. Because plumb line is the metaphor for measuring. For measuring. And do you understand that it's one little act of obedience? That Zerubbabel is not despising the day of small beginnings, which I'll get into context in here which is in Zechariah 4. It's the Hebrew word booze. Oh, drink the booze. Get intoxicated with your failure. That word booze there is despise. When you give your body over to the lies of the enemy, you begin to despise truth. You complain. You get intoxicated with speaking bad reports. That should be a red flag right there that you are becoming an enemy of truth when you complain. So listen to this word picture again of plumb line, Ibn Bedel. The strength and activity of life in the house is the works in the house evidenced in the tongue that controls it. So either the tongue of eternity or the tongue of this present age, which is enmity against truth, is controlling your fruit. It's controlling your breakthrough, your works of righteousness to glorify the Father. So Zechariah 4, For who are you, O great mountain of human obstacle before Zerubbabel? Who with Joshua, who was the high priest at the time, 
had led the return of the exiles from Babylon and was undertaking the rebuilding of the temple. You shall become a plain, a molehill, and he shall bring forth the finishing gable, the stone of the new temple, with loud shoutings of the people crying, Grace, grace, grace to it. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundations of this house. His hands shall also finish it. Then you shall know and recognize and understand that the Lord of hosts has sent me his messenger to you. That's truth. Woo. Hallelujah. Who with reason despises the day of small things? What little thing? Do you understand? When you do the little acts of obedience, the little things, the little things, it's not the big things, the little things. What has God called you to about your temple, your body? Has he said to cut out sugar? Has he said to stop eating late? Has he said to stop going to a certain restaurant? We're talking about little things. We're not talking about losing 50 pounds overnight. We're talking about the little things where entropy, chaos is in your members. Who with reason despises the day of small things? When you do the little things, you're agreeing with truth. As I said in session 17, when we walk in peace, shalom, and we walk in truth, we are truth. We are a walking Bible. We're a written epistle read among others because the works we do are not our works. They're God's works. And God's tongue is in our house. His word is in our house. Hallelujah. Who with reason despises small things for these seven shall rejoice when they see the plummet, the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. Do you see that Holy Spirit, this, these seven are the eyes of the Lord which run to and throughout the earth, to the whole earth? Do you see that God is seeking those who worship him in spirit and in truth, not in the large things, in the little things. It's the little acts of obedience that lead to a consecrated body. Woo! Hallelujah. Then I said to him, the angel who talked with me. Now, this is where we're shifting into a different dimension, the age to come. And I'm going to get into Hebrews 6. And I'm also going to finish right here. And this, then I said to him, the angel who talked with me, what are these two olive trees on the right side and of the, le of the lampstand and on the left side of it? And a second time I said to him, what are these olive branches are beside the two golden tubes or the spouts by the gold, where, where the golden tubes are emptied out? So there's two olive trees. There's a lampstand. What does a lampstand represent? Truth. Whenever you see a lampstand, Whenever you see light is a good metaphor. It's the spirit of truth. It's truth revealed. Okay. Who, uh, verse 11. Then I said to him who talked with me, what are these two olive trees on the right side and on of the lampstand and on the left side of it where it's the golden oil is emptied out. And he answered me, do you not, and a second time I said to him, verse 12, what are these two olive branches, and that's important, that are beside the two golden tubes, the spouts by which the golden oil is emptied out? And he answered me, do you not know what these are? And I said, no, my Lord. Then said he, these are the two sons of oil. Woo! Joshua the high priest and Zerubbabel, the prince of Judah, the two anointed ones who stand before the Lord of the earth as his anointed instruments. Woo! They are an instrument of truth. Do you understand this? And this is where I know how Paul had to feel as he preached and he said he only had an audience of one 
Because when I'm preaching and I'm in that anointing, I don't see people. I don't see faces. I behold the glory of God and I am preaching of Him, by Him, for Him, to Him. I'm just an instrument of truth being emptied out with the anointing oil that doesn't cease. It's ceaseless. It doesn't end. It continually flows because I am in a different dimension and I'm standing before God, hallelujah, in my heart, in my body, in my temple, as presenting myself as a living sacrifice, hallelujah, for His works. Woo! In Jesus' name. So let us get to this because this is amazing. We've got a couple more things here. Now remember, we're going to go a little over my normal noontime time because this is book coaching, session 18. And so with Zechariah 4, we see branch. And let me bring this picture up. It's so beautiful. This is the picture of of Zechariah 4. So those two trees represent Joshua the high priest and Zerubbabel. And that lamp in the middle represents the anointing of the spirit of truth. Illumination. Why? Because there's a mountain of information. It's called warfare. Unnecessary warfare where they have stopped building the temple Because the noise of the warfare of misinformation is louder than truth and their willingness to obey. Oh my goodness, I got into this yesterday that subconsciously, unconsciously within our subconscious, there is an unwillingness to obey. And God allows the trials, He allows the tribulations. Amen, Lisa. He allows it because he wants to expose areas of misinformation where we are unwilling to obey in the little acts. And so the pain comes in trials, in the testing of our faith, so God can see if we'll do little acts of obedience, just like in 2003, starting in 2003, God began to have me pick up trash everywhere I go. And I still do this to this day, to a great measure. Just trash, pick it up everywhere I go. He wanted me to do the little things. Before I started prophesying, before I started ministry, God wanted to see two things. If I would zip my lip and if I would pick up trash. And God showed me. He said, Robin, as you're picking trash off this earth off the ground, you're going to be picking trash of the enemy's lies out of people's souls by the power of truth and the spirit of truth. Why? Not because I'm so great. It is because I'm so radically obedient. Listen, I'm not Miss Spiritual. Everything that there is, I do have shortcomings. I do have failures, but I welcome chastisement I welcome it because it is sweet to my taste because I know it's getting to a part of my heart where it is going to Hebrews 4.12 divide the soul and the spirit show me my intentions and my motives until it produces fruits of righteousness of the life of Christ. Because whatever activities of life are in my house are the works of my house. And it's evidenced by the tongue that controls the house. Amen. And so let's get to this. Because in Isaiah 11.2, it says that out of Jesse, in verse 1, Isaiah 11.1, out of Jesse shall come a branch, a sprout, and that shall be of Jesus Christ, Messiah. We see that in Isaiah 11, 1. We also see in Isaiah 4, we see Jesus, and I want to make sure I get these scriptures for you. We see Jesus 
identified as the branch. And this branch represents John 14, the new vine. Verse 2, Isaiah 4. Now remember, we're in fours. In that day, the branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the land shall be excellent and lovely to those of Israel who have escaped what? This time zone. They've escaped the world. They've escaped the present age that is speaking to their members through salvation and the consecration of the body as they're yielded to truth and they are of the new branch. And that word branch, that's what we're going to get into today. And then we're going to get ready to go into one more thing and then we're going to end. Amen. Oh my goodness. I'll just pray that this blesses you. And so branch here, are you ready? Is Shabol. Shabol. A shebol. Woo! Don't you women want this in your kitchen? A shebol. But it has two B's. So it's shebol. It is that double B pronunciation. And it means a stream flowing. Woo! Wait a minute. Oh my goodness. It means a stream flowing. It means an ear of grain. 30, 60, 100 fold harvest. Amen, Sue. It means a branch. It means a channel. It means a flood. Hallelujah. When the enemy comes in like a flood, Isaiah 59, 10, God raises his branch, his standard, his flood, and that sends the enemy fleeing in seven directions. You want to see the devil flee from your house? Be flowing with rivers of living water, of the life of Christ, of truth, of the power of of the age to come. Amen. And so Shabol is composed of three Hebrew letters. Sheen, Bet, Lamed. Sheen is the ancient symbol of a W, jagged teeth. And it means to consume in the positive. Bet, B-E-T, is a tent. And it means tent, house, household, family. And Lamed is a goad, a cattle goad, which looks like a shepherd's staff with a prick in the curvature. And it means tongue, control, and authority. And so the word picture for branch is being consumed in your house, hallelujah, with the tongue of authority that is controlling your house. Woo! Being consumed in your house with the tongue of authority that is controlling your house. That is the spirit of truth. That is the spirit of prophecy, the testimony of Jesus, Revelation 19.10, that will prophesy what is to come, what is to be, that will destroy fetters, that will bring deliverance, that will bring healing, and that will bring wisdom. Now understand, you need to work with those that God has called you to work with for your freedom and your healing. If he's told you to go to doctors, do not ignore that. If he's told you to get counseling and to go to a psychiatrist, do not ignore it. I've seen it, saints. And sometimes it takes a see of getting out of a season of this present age and that pain is loud and is speaking to you to get you to running to God and those little acts of obedience are going to get you to God because God knows what it takes when it takes to get you where it, he wants you when he wants you there now let me say that again God knows what it takes to get you where he wants you, when he wants you there. He knows the tribulation you are going to go through to know your need, that you need him. And Holy Spirit comes according to the need. Amen. So let's move forward. Now, this is where we're going to go. Are you ready? So when we look at the Tesseract, the net of the tesseract so a net is to throw out but also let me get to this net also means free from all charges or deductions and it's what remains after the deductions after the charges and it's 
look, we're looking at it as our net worth. Our net worth. Our net value. Because remember, measuring means to get the weight, the value, the quality, the extent of what you're measuring. And what are we measuring? Our worth by the truth. Who God says we are. We're measuring it all day long. Now net means what is your net worth? What are you worth? This is how the net looks like for the tesseract. Are you ready? And I've got this in a note. That's how it looks like. It looks like a cross. It looks like a cross and they have it red here. The blood of Jesus that was shed at the cross will bring you into a new dimension, a new time zone. It will wash you clean of this present age. It will purify you and it will resurrect you into a different time zone. Now, are you ready? Because we're going to end in just a second. I got two more things I want to share with you. So Hebrews, we're going to go to Hebrews 6. And let's look at Hebrews 6 verse 4. For it is impossible to restore and bring again to repentance those who have been once all enlightened, who have consciously tasted of the heavenly gift and have, have become sharers of the Holy Spirit. It's the fourth dimension. And have felt how good the Word of God, truth, is and the mighty power of the age and the world that is to come. Luke 17, 20 and 21, the kingdom of heaven is not coming with signs and wonders. It is in man's hearts. Ecclesiastes 3, 10 and 11, the kingdom of God, which is eternity, he is the eternal God, is planted in man's hearts. So let's look at Hebrews 6 and let's look at this particular word and then we're going to go to a couple more verses and then we're going to end as I give you, what's his name? I want to make sure I say his name right. The Mandelbrot set, the mathematician. Oh my goodness, it's going to blow your mind. And so let's look at Hebrews 6 and we're looking at verse 5, the powers of the world that is to come. And so this world, actually in Hebrews, ahion, ahion, and it means the same as perpetuity. Do you hear that, Lisa? Perpetuity. What does that mean? Infinite. It means an age. It means eternal, never ending. Where do we see this? We see this, I'm so glad you wanted to know, we see this foreshadowing in Joshua 1. And I talked about this the other day because I love property law and I've taught on this. So Joshua 1, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, what did Moses represent? The legal system that brought the commandments to show man what sin is. What did Jesus bring? Grace. How did the mountain come down before Zerubbabel? Grace. The information, the mountain before you will come down as you speak the word of truth because you're experiencing grace. You know your net worth, that you're worthy because God so loved the world that he sent his only son, John 3, 16, which by the way, 16 is four times four. Amen. I still have some more to go because there's so much information. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, so the end of the present age, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses minister, my servant is dead, so now arise, go over the Jordan, you and all the people into the land which I am giving them to the Israelites. So this is where we're going to transition into the new time zone. Joshua, Yahushua, 
represents the foreshadowing of Jesus. His father is the son. He's the son of N-U-N. So his father is none. Now, are you ready? Because this is mind-blowing. So Joshua 1, that name means, in Hebrew, that name means perpetuity. So N-U-N means perpetuity. It means never-ending. This actually comes from noon oh my goodness we're doing this at noon and it means to shoot forth it means to branch out perpetually it means you're never going to stop branching out perpetually it's infinite it's eternal you're going to keep growing truth is going to keep growing oh my goodness get ready because it's going to be so powerful and so Moses represents the old age, the law of this present age, the legal system where Jesus represents. He's the son of the eternal God, the God of infinity, the God of perpetuity. Now watch this. We see in Deuteronomy 33, 27, 33 means anointing. 27 means the new time zone. It's peace. It's shalom. And in Deuteronomy 33, 27, the anointing of truth. Truth is the new time zone. By faith, we enter into truth. We branch out infinitely and never end. Verse 27, Deuteronomy 33, the eternal God is your refuge and dwelling place. What? The eternal God. In Him we have our living, our moving, and our being. The eternal God is your refuge and dwelling place. And underneath are the everlasting arms. He drove the enemy before you and thrust him out, saying, destroy. Do you understand that in truth, by the spirit of truth, as you seek God in spirit and in truth, that He becomes your dwelling place and He lifts you up above this present age and He is eternal. He's never ending. Now, I've got three more things and this is what I wanted to show you. So today, God had me study before coming on here what is called the Mandel Brought Set. M-A-N-D-E-L-B-R-O-T M A N and somebody can spell it out if you will please. M A N D E L Mandel Brot. It's all one word. B R O T. M A N D E L B R O T. That actually came from a mathematician, and this is what he found. He worked for IBM. Mandelbrot did. He was a geometrist, and the thing with geometry is when he started geometry as a young... Thank you, Lisa. When he started geometry as a young boy, he saw pictures, pictures, pictures. He didn't see numbers. He saw pictures. But this is what's amazing. He couldn't do what he needed to do. Hey, Renee, because computers had not been invented yet until later, and once computers were invented and he was still living and doing this set, and this set is called Fractal, F-R-A-C-T-A-L. Lisa, if you could put that up. Fractal, F-R-A-C-T-A-L, patterns, which means little things of, of, of uh, let me, in fact, let me just say it exactly how it says it because I don't want to just give my own spin on it. Fractals. Whatever is your fact, all will be your fractal. Listen to that. Whatever is your fact, all will be your fractal. Amen, Lisa. Thank you. So fractals are never-ending patterns that have details. Okay? They're infinitely complex. They go to infinity. They never stop. Now, are you ready? And so... He was the one, Mandelbrot, that created the term fractal. Now, are you ready? 
Mandelbrot finally developed what is called, and I'll show you this fractal right here. He developed, this is the Mandelbrot fractal, and I'll show you the rest of it in just a minute. That is the Mandelbrot fractal, okay? And he found this as he worked at IBM, and while working at IBM, amen, Amy, it's the details, it's the little things, it's the little things, amen. And so he was working at IBM on computers, and they were sending computer communication data over wires. Remember, entropy and information theory, it's about the information, it's about the data that's in your members. This is what Mandelbrot discovered. He discovered that there was an interruption in the data. And this is what blew his mind and everybody else in science, period, okay? He saw that there was a pattern to the disruption of information. And he kept zooming in on an hour of the pattern, on a month of the pattern, on a year of the pattern, on a week of the pattern, on seconds of the pattern. And it, praise God, Barbara, and it was the exact pattern. The exact pattern. The exact pattern. On a microscopic level. We'll get this. And so Mandelbrot did this fractal and what they found as they zoomed in a thousand times, ten thousand times, a million times, which is larger than this universe, a billion times. Are you ready to see what they found as they were doing? Hold on, let me get the fractals up. As they were doing the Mandelbrot fractals, as they were doing, zooming in on an infinite level, perpetuity. Look, I'm just going to show you this. This is what they found as they zoomed in. Are you ready? Let me just see if I can go down. Hold on one second. Look, these fractals, as you go deeper and deeper and deeper, a million times, a thousand times, a billion times into this particular shape, they found that it was infinite and that this data, this information, it's data and this information that it had shapes. It had details, and it was never ending. I know, Dina, isn't that amazing? It was never ending. And so I thought about, as God brought to me, He said, Robin, do you know that my truth in your body at the receptor level does that? How deep do you want to go in truth? How much detail do you want to see of me? And do you know that Mathematicians call this the thumbprint of God. What? Mathematicians call this the thumbprint of God. And this all evolved initially from Cantor, which I taught on Cantor, who was a strong Christian and got banished by the Math Academy in France. And his books got burned because he proved God. That's why he was persecuted because he proved God in math. But Manderbalt created this Manderbalt set fractal. And God said, Robin, how deep do you want to go in truth? He said, just like mathematicians blow into that microscopically a million times and there's still detail, there's still pattern, there's still beauty, there's still grace, there's still strength, there's still color. He said, do you know that my word that is infinite from eternity, do you know that my word does that inside of you? 
it is going to interrupt the enemy's plans. And God told me this back in 2003. He says the enemy might have a plan and he might have his own thing, but I've got an appointment that will disrupt the enemy's plan in Jesus name. Yes, see, that's what infinite means. It means endless. That's what perpetuity means. It means endless. Do you know that Jesus is the son of eternity? He is the son of the eternal God and we dwell in eternity and that is our home decor. But can we perceive it? That power is available. So now this is where I am getting closer to ending. I've got one more scripture to read after this but before that I'm going to read this from 2013 or 2014 when I wrote healing of the soul and <clears throat> this is from a part of my note and I'll copy and paste this and put it on Facebook after this and uh, this is this is how awesome our God is because remember we're talking about harvest not four months into the harvest Harvest is here every day. Truth is here. Seeking God in spirit and in truth is here every day. Harvest is here every day. The fourth dimension is here every day. So are you ready? So in Nehemiah 11.25 through 36. 11.25-36. Look, I'm not going to even read all these names. I'll try. As for the villages with their fields, some people of Judah, Kiriob, uh, dwelt in Kiriath Arba, Dabon, and Jacazabel, Jack, Jacobzil, and their villages in Jeshua, Moladak, Beth Pelet, Haz, Hazar Shual. I'm not going to even attempt to butcher these words. I'm going to put it on my Facebook. It is Nehemiah 11, 25 through 36. So are you ready? When I unpack these names, amen, Amy. When I unpack these names, this is what it means. All of these names combined from these chapters, this is what it means. Are you ready? As we praise God, knowing we are in the city of four. What? Wait a minute. As we praise God, knowing we're in the city of four, because, guess what? The village, verse 25, as for the villages with their fields, some people of Judah dwelt in Kiriath Arba. That, in verse 25, means city of four. Four. One, two, three, four. Not in the first dimension, not in the second dimension, not in the third dimension, but there is a fourth dimension and it represents eternity. Harvest, that's eternal, the eternal God. So let me read you what all these names combined mean. As we praise God, knowing we are in the city of four, we are in the fourth act, the Tesseract, Song of Solomon 4, which I'll get to in a minute. When we feel as though we are wasting away, God gathers us to himself, for Jehovah is salvation, and he brings us to our birth, our race, causing us to come to him as our house of escape. What did he talk about? Those who escape, right? From the jackal village that would clinch to us, we drank of the well of the sevenfold oath where God brings forth the foundation of this place through winding as we dance in the fount of the pomegranate. Hold on. Matthew's messaging me. Hold on one second. Sorry. Let me start all over again. As we praise God, knowing we are in the city of four, the fourth act, Song of Solomon 4, and I put Song of Solomon 4 there in the fourth act, because Song of Solomon has acts, and that's the fourth act, and it has 16 verses. What's four times four? 16. When we feel as though we are wasting away, God gathers us to himself of Jehovah, for Jehovah is salvation, and he is. He brings us to our birth, 
our race, causing us to come to Him as our house of escape. From the jackal village that would clinch to us, we drank of the well of the sevenfold oath, where God brings forth the foundation of this place through winding as we dance in the fount of the pomegranate. When the enemy assails us like a hornet, God brings us up to a greater height where he cast it off and brings forth justice for his people, making us invincible as we dig over the word, seeking him, finding him in the well of the sevenfold oath, living waters, Holy Spirit, grace. This is the place where we lament, realizing it is only the son of the right hand of the Father that has drank of the cup to make us a holy pot. And holy pots are in Zechariah 14. I've taught on it. Jesus ascended the hill and has hidden within himself the heap of ruins, sin, that we would be answering our prayers, our cries, and bring us into the house of God. He lifts us up to the high place in Jehovah's clouds, showing us the castle. He, the high place, where there are two wine presses, double-fold portion of the righteousness of Christ, whereby the sword he cuts and dies us to remove the hidden folly, causing the travail of his strength and force, his goodness, his substance that was made by the skilled carpenter so that we are joined to his praise, his glory jointly with the son of the right hand. What? I know that's a lot and I'll post it, okay? So this is where we'll end. Song of Solomon. This is where we will end. Song of Solomon 4. We are in the fourth act. The harvest act. The tesseract. The fourth dimension. Amen. And this is where we'll end. And again, it has 16 verses. 4 times 4 is 16. How fair are you, my love, he said. How very fair. Your eyes behind your veil remind me of those of a dove. Your hair makes me think of black wavy fleece, of a flock of the Arabian goats, which one sees trailing down Mount Gilead, beyond the Jordan on the frontiers of the desert. This represents the strength of the righteousness of Christ. Your teeth, indicating the words, are like a flock of shorn ewes that have come up from washing. Our words are pure, of which are all in pairs and none is missing among them. All of our words are pure. Your lips are like a thread of scarlet. Your mouth is lovely. Your cheeks are are like halves of pomegranate behind your veil, the countenance of Christ. Your neck, being a bondservant, is like the Tower of David built for an arsenal, whereon hang a thousand bucklers, all of them shields of warriors. That's where you do your spiritual warfare. You stand your ground. Your two breasts, indicating the righteousness of Christ Jesus, are like fawns, like twins of a gazelle that feed among the lilies, that represents purity, the lilies, the white lilies, until the day breaks and the shadows flee away, darkness flees away. In my thoughts, I will get to the mountain of myrrh and the hill of frankincense to him. That's what she's thinking. To him whom my soul adores. He exclaimed, Oh my love, how beautiful you are. There is no flaw in you. You've got to stay in the fourth act. Come away with me from Lebanon, my promised bride. Come away with me from Lebanon. Depart from the top of Amana, from the peak of Sinir and Hermon, from the lion's dens, from being devoured. 
from the mountains of the leopards, from being devoured. You have ravished my heart and given me courage, my sister, my promised bride. You have ravished my heart and given me courage with one look from your eyes, with the jewel of your necklace, were bond servants. How beautiful is your love, my sister, my bride. How much better is your love than wine and the fragrance of your ointments than all spices. Your lips, O oh my promised bride, drop honey. From the honeycomb, honey and milk are under your tongue and the odor of your garments of the odor of Lebanon. A garden enclosed and barred is my sister, my promised bride, a spring shut up, a fountain sealed. Your shoots, that's branches, woo, are an orchard of pomegranates. They're like those fractals. They're never going to end. They go infinitely. Glory to God. A paradise with precious fruits. Henna and spikener plants spikenard and saffron, calamus and cinnamon, with all the trees of frankincense, myrrh and aloes, with all the chief spices, you are a fountain springing up in a garden, a well of living waters and flowing streams from Lebanon. You have called me a garden, she said. Oh, I pray that the cold north wind and the soft south wind may blow upon it, the garden and that its spices may flow out in abundance for you in whom my soul delights. Let my beloved come into his garden and eat of his choicest fruits. What? Eat? Do you understand that we bear fruits of righteousness for that deep relationship with God. Hallelujah. And that's who you are, saints. That's who you are in truth. And that is what the power of God in truth does in your life in Jesus' name. Now we get on to chapter 6. What a way to end. And now you know what book coaching is for mindfulness the mind of Christ, get it. And if you want book coaching, message me. We'll get you hooked up. God bless you. I love you.